All right, here we go. <clears throat> hey, what's up, dudes and dudettes? It's Drew here from The Anxious Truth, back with Holly. What up, Halls? Hi. Hi. <laughs> we are going to tackle chapter nine of the Claire Weeks Hope and Help for Your Nerve, Hope and Help for Your Nerves book. What's it called in Europe? Hope, Peace from Nervous. You have a different name there, or I think I was it Peace from Nervous Suffering, or is that a different book completely? I don't know. I'm not sure, but it, it's out there under about a billion different names. But it's all this. It's seemingly seemingly all the same book. Anyway, yeah. Hope and Help for Your Nerves. We've done the first eight chapters of this over the course of like the last three years. <laughs> like, thought I wasn't even born yet when we started. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's for, yeah, three and a half yeah. years. Yeah. She'll be graduating university when we finish the last chapter, I'm quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to do chapter nine today. If you guys do not have the book, uh, Hope and Help for Your Nerves, you can find it anywhere. Oh, you can go to theanxioustreat.com and follow the bookstore link. There's a link there where you get it, yes. making it easy for people. And yes, it would make a couple of bucks for the channel and we'll buy Holly a new camera. So. Please, because look at this blueness that I'm in. What's going on? It's very warm and yellow in this room. I don't know what's happening. I had, had to turn my Christmas tree lights off and everything. Not good. We believe you. We've all seen you. You're not that blue. So <laughs> <laughs> let's start. Chapter nine in the book is all about, it's kind of talking about how the, she talks about setbacks. She talks about the fear of it's not going fast enough, all those things. So it's a lot of things that we hear about often, like in the Facebook group, where people yeah. are like, Hey, I'm doing it now, but how come it's not getting any better? Or I was doing so great and now I'm not. What's going on? They think they're going backwards. And she talks specifically about that. Exactly. So. Yeah. This is this chapter is called "Being Yourself Again," mm -hmm. and it's the it, it's so this is for people that are like a little bit further along now, and they're actually like into where they're being able to put into practice the the sort of facing and accepting or surrendering you know and, and the sort of letting time pass but this is more maybe about the letting time pass bit i think so I, and by the way we should probably say if you haven't seen the first eight videos in the series if you go to the website or go to my youtube channel or whatever or the podcast you'll see watch the first eight before you do this one like yeah, don't start yeah. with this so this is about you're right now you've understanding what's going on you know what it is and you know what you're supposed to do you're starting to do it now and how do things start to change or not change is what she's really addressing so i made some notes as we went and the first thing i highlighted is right at the beginning of the chapter she says now it is almost certain that despite your new approach to your illness your symptoms will continue to return for some time perhaps at first as acutely as before you read this book so like you have this blinding flash of insight. Oh, this is the way. This is awesome. And then you discover like, yeah, but I still feel the same way. Yeah, we see this come a lot, right? We get a lot of people saying this. Constantly, constantly. And she follows up because uh, I think it's all kind of the same quote. She finds she wrote that after she's talked she was a, a doctor herself. And she says she often finds that after talking to a, what she called a nervously ill patient. And there's a lot of old language in this chapter, too. Um, they leave the room and they're all happy, like, ah, oh, this is it. I, you know, I see the light. I know the way. And then, you know, a few days later, there's all their crestfallen, disappointed, like, ah, oh, this, but it doesn't work. It's not working. Yeah. Cause all yeah. their symptoms are still there and the thoughts are still racing. And, you know, exactly. So, I mean, those are my first two things that I highlighted, which were so, like the yeah. first two paragraphs. Yeah. So a lot of that is about managing your expectation when she says that it's not, do not expect to be instantly cured. Do not expect to find instant relief because this is so important, isn't it? Because if you're doing it just so that you feel relief, it's almost mm -hmm. like completely defying the whole point of it. You're not trying to face and, and surrender and let it all happen to you so that you can feel better. You're trying to do that so that you don't add anything add anything to it so you're not adding that fear to it right you're learning you to do not it with be the afraid intention of it. feeling better it's not you kind of missing the point exactly that and i think that's what sets so many people up i mean number one everybody wants to feel better right away so i think we could all understand that but it's that you know okay i'm going to accept my anxiety i'm going to accept these symptoms but i'm i still don't want to accept that i have to have them be there i want to make them go away as fast as possible and you have to be super honest with yourself. If that's really what you think this is going to do, then you're going to set yourself up for this this disappointing thing that she's talking about. Yeah. 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 And what is the goal in the end? Not to make it go away, but. 
No, but to be, you can't change it. You can just change your reaction to it, right? You, it's yeah. a, it's understanding that you're not in any danger, and so that you don't add that fear to it, which keeps you perpetually in this, right. you know, um, fight or flight and sens highly sensitized state. But mm. what's so important to learn is, or to realize, is that when you're in that sensitized state, it does it takes a while. Even if you're doing it bang on correctly, what you should be doing every single time takes a long time to be able to come down from that level of like sensitization. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's um, what people forget is like you're learning to experience those things without being afraid of experiencing those things. And yeah. that, that takes a while. Like, so and you're, what you're giving yourself is repeated experiences with a positive outcome that says I was sweating and dizzy and felt like I was going to faint and all of those horrible things. And those, I thought I was going to go insane and I didn't do anything. I just let it all happen. And I turned out, okay, I didn't, I didn't, None of those bad things happen. And you need that repeated experience to say like, oh, I guess I don't have to be afraid of that. So yeah. it, in the end, that's that's really what's going on. And she actually addresses that. Um, she says it's enough at this stage to wish to be unafraid. Which yeah, is, I love I that. Think, <laughs> yeah, me too. Like, it's OK. Everybody wants to be not afraid anymore. That's totally fine to want to not be afraid. But the only way to learn to not be afraid is to first be afraid. There's no yeah. other way. Yeah. You can't just wish that you won't be afraid and then, and then, oh, I'm not afraid anymore. Like, right. you have to just go through it and, and sort of keep seeing that nothing happens to you and that actually there is nothing to be afraid of, you know, yeah. and that that is what teaches you that. And then through that experience, you actually sort of become not afraid of it, even if it seems impossible that you would one day not be afraid of this because it's mm -hmm. so frightening at the time. But if you just, this is where we talk about the leap of faith, right? Yeah. If you just sort of put your trust into it and say like, well, I just want to not be afraid. So I'm going to just trust what everyone says and go through this and try not to add any fear to it. And, and then if you keep doing that and keep doing it, you realize that nothing bad happens by, by letting it do its worst, you know? Right. So you can't just decide to be not afraid. You have to learn through experience to be not afraid. And the experience yeah. is being afraid and nothing bad happens. And like, oh, okay, I didn't have to be afraid. So uh, people say that all the time. How can I just ignore it? It's so scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I know. I <laughs> I know. I know. It's so like, yeah, it's super scary. Do it anyway. Like, and she's saying yeah. this. That's really what she's saying. So um, I don't know. You got anything else to add before we go into the next chat? The next thing she talks about was she yeah, because the next bit's a bit of a contentious issue, it right? Is. So, but yeah. yeah, there was one thing she wrote something really nice. I don't really like analogies a lot of the time because they're not the actual thing you're talking about. So right. you're often very flawed. But <laughs> this is a really nice analogy that she did. Right? She said, "So where it's this people when people are like I said that even if you're doing it right and you're doing it right every time and they're going like but what well, I'm still not." better I'm still feeling it am I doing it wrong and she says imagine that you're a runner that's finished a race it's not like as soon as you cross that line you just instantly stop you have to like run it off at the end until you can actually stop you can't just oh I got to the end and then sort of like yeah freeze frame <laughs> as you stop like true no true. you have to like cross the line and, and come to a sort of standstill and and you know that it still takes a bit of time even after you've cross the finish line you know that's yeah. what she says so you know not that it's necessarily going to be that quick even but just to realize that just because you've crossed the line of something and, and you've done it it doesn't it you don't just stop there you you know you keep going yeah. and you keep going and then and then you sort of slow down and, and then and then you're done then the race is won because all those old habits and behaviors have momentum over weeks yeah, months maybe years for some it people like, decades yeah yeah, yeah, a long time. And I would even like that's really and yeah, I'm a, you're right about the analogy thing, but if we run with run with that part in the pond a little bit more, we could say that like the this isn't even she's saying like, you know, the the realization of what this is and understanding, oh, now I know what it is, now I know what I have to do. That's not the finish line. That's mm -hmm. it's almost like a series of races. So that's the that's the starting point of the next race that you have to run now. Yeah. So, yeah, it's never that it's just learning what it is. It's, yeah, it's not the end of the race. There are multiple events happening here. You got to do, you got to get good at all of them. Right. So the next one, and you and I probably disagree 
to a certain degree on this next thing too, which is good. I like it. So she mentions (laughs) now, uh, before we get into it though, and I think we could both agree on this, you have to remember that she was writing in the 1950s and sixties. Yeah. So things were a little bit different and you could tell by the language. So the very first it's called the front line of battle is this, the, the subhead in the section. She says, do not think I expect you to do this without the help of sedation. I think they even called it sedation back then. You know, it's so it's all it sounds really heavy, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Like, sedation. you know, but that's what they said back then. So it's totally fine. She, she's talking about the use of what she calls tranquilizers, which is reasonably accurate, but again, it's dated today in you know 2019. We were talking about the use of benzodiazepines, like Ativan or Xanax and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Clonazepam, right? Um <clears throat> so Right, there's a zillion of them. If it ends in AM, it's it's one of these, pretty much. Clonopin kind of applies to. So you why don't you jump into this? Like I, I respect your your view on this. You have a different view than I do. We don't really have a different view. You have oh, a soft view. We do have a different experience, maybe. Correct. And your experience um, is as valid as mine. So Yeah. Well, just my experience but where I came from, I came from a, a, a benzo place. <laughs> I was on benzos for a long time, all through my sort of anxiety career, and um, and 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 it allowed me. I, well, it didn't, <laughs> but I felt like it did, and maybe it did in some ways. You know, I'd got I got myself to that point where I wasn't hiding in my house and and sort of hiding in my bedroom, suffering from anxiety. I was going out and I was working and I was traveling and I was flying and I was going all over and moving to different cities by myself and and really sort of like getting out there and living life, but with sort of crippling anxiety and panic attacks at the same time. But I don't know if I would have done that if I didn't have, you know, because I was taking it a lot, you know, it was like every time I went to work, I was taking like Valium and stuff to get myself out the door or, you know, and stuff like that. So I'm not saying that's what helped me, but certainly I'd, by the time I came to this approach that we talk about, these accepting and the facing, I'd already done a lot of the work already. So I wasn't like agoraphobic. I was, but I was making myself get out and do stuff anyway, like partly right. just through sheer necessity and partly through just like sheer determination to not like be made sort of to stay. I just thought, cause I thought this was something I had to live with my whole life. So I was like, well, if I have to live with it my whole life, I'm not gonna live in my bedroom. Cause I had it from when I was really young, like 11. So I yeah. didn't know any different. It's not like I was a normal person, adult living my life. I grew up with it. So I had a very different experience of that and I so yeah so I used I did use benzos a lot to get myself out you know every time I was flying every time I was doing a lot of things you know I would I would take it and it and I managed to go out and do stuff so by the time I came to this approach I had done a lot of that hard work because we meet people on this journey and when they come to us and you know they find this approach they're still you know locked in their bedrooms and in their houses and they can't go anywhere and it is really tough and very daunting so me i'm sort of on the claire weeks like if it helps you get out the door if it helps you do stuff to learn that like you can actually get out of the house and and do stuff and and go there if taking some uh, like a tranquilizer if taking a benzo like helps you to do that so that it helps you in your learning process like i'm totally like whatever makes it easier like do that but just what I will add is that I only actually got better when I stopped taking benzos because every time I was taking one I was reinforcing the sort of false belief that I that that feeling anxiety and feeling panic was something to be squashed and sort of controlled and held down so that I could just about get through something. I was white knuckling my way through life. Right. And so it was only when I actually went, so when I sort of realized all this and came to this sort of like approach and stuff, I realized that my taking a, a my taking a benzo was a form of avoidance because I was trying to avoid the anxiety. I wasn't facing it and I wasn't letting it do its worst because I was trying to keep it down. You know, I was trying to like keep just about on top of everything. If I take a tablet, I can just get through this. (laughs) So that was my, so it was only when I stopped taking 
benzos and you know i tapered yeah. it and i did it carefully and gradually right, right, it was right. only when i stopped taking them and was suddenly faced with that thing of like i'm gonna go out the house without any tablets on me and if like a panic attack comes to me then oh my god like i'm just gonna have to go through it and it once i did that i mean and then it worked like recovery came to me quite quickly because i'd yeah. already done so much of that work i only had a little bit more to go yeah. But I had to do that huge step of, you know, I'd been on Valium for 22 years and I had to sort of suddenly learn to, to do everything that I was doing without it. And right. that was crazy. But, you know, that's what that's how I got better in the end. And that's I, how I got better. I think as just a side note of encouragement for anybody that's listening and is taking those medications, 22 years and like now you don't take them and you're healthy no. and have a good life and like you're functioning. <laughs> So yeah, so many people get so afraid, like, oh, I'm addicted to them now. And yes, addiction is an issue with those. That's true. But you are, you know, you did it and you came off it and now you live without them yeah. and you're fine and, I and you're healthy. And I didn't have that particularly bad time coming off them as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on the, on the so, flip side of that, we should also mention though, that she was talking about tranquilizers or what we would say is benzos. Now she was not talking about antidepressants. They didn't exist no. when she wrote these books. Right. So that's important. And, and that's two different things. And we could talk about that maybe in its own video one day. But there's two schools of thought on this. And I, and I understand the concept of I can't even go from my bedroom to my living room. So how am I supposed to go out the door? So I'm, I'm going to use Valium or whatever it is in small doses. And I could say small doses only when needed with the intention of not using it. Like yeah. not as – right. And I can understand that approach. And for some people, that's a valid approach. That's okay. The other, the flip side of that is, and this speaks to the antidepressant thing too, for people who are involved in behavioral therapy, they will say, if you take away the symptoms, then what are you learning? So you just have to be yeah. aware of that, right? That's why the intention always has to be, I'm going to take it this time, but I'm going to really try to do it next time without it or as yeah. soon as possible without it, which is fine. Um, and the other thing that you might look at is, okay, I can't even leave my bedroom to go to the kitchen without having a panic attack. Well, okay, so you don't have to go to the mailbox or the supermarket or the shopping mall or on a world cruise. All you have to do is get up out of your bed. Like yes. you, can, you can break it down into the tiniest little thing that makes you anxious and attack them little by little by little. It would mean yeah. slower starting, but that's another way to do it maybe without, without the meds. But either yeah, way, sure. But also, I'll just add as well, if if there's that person that maybe like can't leave their house or something, but through necessity or just sometimes because of life, like yeah, you have yeah. to do something that's Stuff way bigger than your just, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I would, that's when I I'm like, if your doctor's right. prescribed it and said, yeah. take it when you need it, I would just yeah. say, well, just take it and go and do the thing that you have I, to do. You know? I do. I understand that. Somebody who's completely homebound leaves the house, you know, and we see them every day or like white knuckles their way through five things that they can do. But now they have a wedding to go to. It's two hours yeah. away. It's an all day affair. You know, it, it, uh, that one time use. Because that wedding could turn into a really horrific experience otherwise, and it could be a flooding thing. And. So there are places where this stuff can be used judiciously as a tool. I don't disagree I always with find that. myself singing the Walker Brothers, like, make it easy on yourself. <laughs> Just like, like, life's really hard. Like, you don't have yeah. to make it the hardest thing right. all the time, you know? Right. Sometimes right. should maybe just make it easier on yourself whilst trying to do something really difficult. Exactly. And now with the, just very quickly, I don't want to get too far into it, but the antidepressants are different because antidepressants are a long-term thing. They're not an event by event thing. So she no. was not talking about that. And I don't want anybody to confuse the fact that, you know, Dr. Weeks said it's okay to take meds. She was not talking about Prozac and, Z yeah. and, and, and Paxil and those, and those things. That's different. And in behavioral science circles, that's even more hotly debated because when you start to take an antidepressant and it knocks everything down after 10 days or two weeks, if it does, if it works for you, then what exactly are you working on? You don't, and that's the no, that's the people who say like, yeah. well, I, I, they worked great for me, but here I am in this anxiety group, still unable to go to work, and you know it, it can delay things. Anyway, so that's what she was talking about there. Uh, that's probably enough on that one. But I, I agree, the way you used it is probably perfect. And sometimes, well, no, I, I mean, I not really, but yeah. <laughs> well, I think, and when we, I think when we first met, you were you were just. I'm guessing you were just at the tail end of that when we when uh, yeah, met, but going I back came probably five, six years ago. I, I just stopped taking them, yeah. And right, I was going right. Through just, oral, yeah. 
But you, it was pretty quick before there, your tone changed, like almost immediately. Suddenly, you were yeah. like better quickly, which was great. So yeah, let's move on to the next thing. Actually, yeah. in a in a couple. Yeah, yes, the rapid months. recovery thing. She mentions that. So let's talk about keep occupied. This is this is a Ooh. thing. Yeah, and I see this a lot, especially in the group. And by the way, if you don't know, we're talking the Facebook group. There's a link in my everywhere. There's a link to join the Facebook group. Go and do it. <laughs> Get in so it. it's every. Get in it, man. Just join the crowd. So she says it's essential that you be occupied while awaiting cure. However, I must warn you against feverishly seeking occupation in order to prevent to forget yourself. So there's a fine line between like I need to be busy all the time to distract myself from this yeah. thing that I hate not what you want to do and just sitting so sometimes i see people that have been dealing with this for such a long time they start to see this new way they want to do it and essentially sometimes all they wind up doing is this so the only occupation they have is recovery just thinking about anxiety exactly like and you see people who get stuck with like well uh, every time i feel anxious i'll go out for a walk that's fine but there has to be more to life than waking up and wondering how you're going to recover that day and just yeah. walking around your block. So it doesn't matter what it is, reading, music, you know, puzzles, art, volunteering somewhere, whatever it is, yeah. some occupation, because you have to try and live the life that- I would say especially occupation that means that you have to interact with other people is really good. Yeah, yeah, it is. But and, I just think that- it's good for you in general, you know? I, th- I would agree with that 100%. And I think it's also, you, you're almost pretending in the beginning. And that's okay. So like, well, I'm going to go and, and whatever, volunteer at, at the local soup kitchen or whatever it is, picking something. I don't care what it is. Um, I don't want to. I'm terrified when I'm there. It makes me feel awful. But you're almost pretending to be a recovered normal person again. And then you learn to be a recovered normal person again by doing those things. Yeah. And if you're housebound today, you're not going to go and get a full-time job in a city 45 minutes away. I get that. But yeah. it is important to do more than just and be completely consumed with, well, this activity that I want to do right now, if I want to do a puzzle right now, is that recovery? Is that the right thing? Should I do that? Am I not allowed to do that? Did Dr. Weeks say anything about doing puzzles? Like it's a, I understand why people get trapped that way, but it's important to recognize when you are in that pattern and try and break it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think um, one of the key words that she says in this little paragraph about um, keeping occupied and the difference between being occupied to avoid anxiety, because obviously that's not, you know, sort of helpful, right. <clears throat> is the word meanwhile, in the meantime, in the meantime, like, yeah. I'm gonna like, you know, I'm working on my anxiety, and I'm trying not to avoid it. And I'm trying to accept and surrender to it. But in the meantime, whilst I'm doing all this, I'm gonna like, do some other stuff too. Yeah, yeah. And it's that word like in the meantime, which is very different than like, I'm gonna do this stuff so like that I don't have to think about anxiety. Do you know what right. I mean? Right, or while I'm, while I'm like accepting and dealing with my anxiety, I'm also going to cook dinner or I'm yeah. also going to take a walk and buy some veggies or whatever, whatever it happens to be. And we say this yeah. a lot, like life is exposure, can be exposure. Totally so sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just the the active living way. So that's super important. Don't get trapped in that, like, all I do is think about recovery, read about it, talk about it, being on the forums, and, you know, like, you got to do more than that. You really do. Yeah. So let's talk about the quick recovery thing, which was, I think, great that she mentioned it. And yeah. And you were a good example, I think. Yeah, Personally. but like I said, I'd done a lot of that work already. Yeah. I had okay. a long time to work on it. Right, right. But I think we've, we've both seen people around over the past few years that have this experience. And it's great when it happens. It's possible. What, like, like the quick one? The quick one, where they even, they've been at this for years. I know of one particular person, she might be listening and she lives in Pennsylvania. She might know who she is. Just months ago, she was in tears, couldn't drive her son a mile away to school. And, you know, she like, oh, okay, I have to do this. And she started doing it religiously and relentlessly. And within like two months, Like she kind of got most of her life back. So that can happen. Yeah, it's possible. I had a friend that was, um, he was in just, you know, total like crisis mode. He sort of had to quit everything he was doing and move back with his parents and, you know, in in his sort of late thirties and stuff. And, and, and he just didn't know what he was doing at all. And he, he didn't really understand even particularly what was happening to him. And I remember just talking to him on the phone one day and sort of like very quickly like realized that you know he was having a complete like anxiety 
panicked yeah. sort of, you know, meltdown and, and was now suffering from panic disorder. And, um, <clears throat> and all literally, I, t- I was maybe on the phone for him for like an hour and a half. And by the end of that phone call, he was like, <laughs> better <laughs> and crazy, like the right? next time i spoke to him like you know like two weeks later or something he'd now like gone and moved somewhere else and, and he was doing great and like sit and this was maybe two and a half years ago and he's been doing great ever since and yeah. he just said like it just sort of clicked with him and he just realized what was happening and what he needed to do about it and just the understanding of it clink 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 you know he, he obviously like still had setbacks and and yeah. stuff but he, yeah. he got it and he was just like oh this is what i have to do this is what's happening to me and it was just like it was just amazing to like see it was just so incredible i've had i had two experiences with panic disorder bordering on agoraphobia in my life and the first time it ever happened when i was a sophomore in college in 1986 i had that experience i read this book and within a matter of days or a week boom i was good to go and I, yeah. but that came back to bite me later because I didn't actually have to do all the work and learn it. I just sort of like, hey, this is cool. This made it all better. And I never actually <laughs> learned the process. But it, it's possible it happened to me the first time. The second time, it, yeah. didn't, it wasn't that way. Well, but. that brings us on into the next bit that she makes, which is about the, um, is this the next bit? The, the setback note? Yeah, or? the next is, uh, well, she talks about quick recovery, which is quick. And then she says gradual recovery is the next one. Uh-huh. Next list. So she, yeah, she gets there. Setback is after that. Oh, yeah, and sorry. So when she talks about gradual recovery, and I had to highlight this just because it was adorable. Like, it's so 1950s, like, get up there in the fresh air. Take a stiff constitution. She says, with good food. She actually mentions with oh, good yeah, food. Oh, yeah, that's I so know, cute. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> um, I'm not poo-pooing good food. Everybody should eat healthy, of course. But I found it so fascinating that she literally wrote that, like, Physical exhaustion may delay recovery, but even here, with good food and peace of mind, you're you're going to be okay. Like just have <laughs> hearty soup and everything will be great. <laughs> but uh, I was kind of cute. But she uses this thing like the strength in a limb may depend on the confidence with which it is used. Yeah, which is super. We see this all the time, and honestly, that's just believing what your anxiety is telling you what your thoughts are like oh i can't possibly do it. i i'm if i do that i will fall over i can't stand yeah, up i'm I dizzy i will faint most common thing we hear like oh really go stand on one foot tell me how it goes and people stand on one foot and it's like oh my god i didn't fall over maybe i'm not really dizzy and <laughs> yeah. it's like okay that's what she's addressing here like i yeah. think she's addressing the idea that the fear that you feel will tell you not to do certain things and so you yeah. think you can't and until you do it and then you discover, oh, I actually can do that. She it's- gives that really interesting example of like a woman that was going to the gym for three years after she was, you know, yeah. sort of recovering from nervous, nervous illness. I'm saying it right. just like off the top. Yeah, like she did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> And um, and the, the the instructors in that gym obviously didn't really sort of understand it very well, and they were like, "Oh no, you've got to be, you you haven't used your muscles, and so therefore you must because you've suffered from nervous illness, you've got to be really careful on your muscles." And they sort of like implanted this weird belief in her that she right. she had to take it really easy, otherwise her body wouldn't be able to yeah. take it. And then Doctor Weeks said to her like, "No, no, no, it's just comfort. You just got no confidence about using your muscles. Like use them, they're absolutely fine." And she was like. Right. Really, and then she went down, and then she started like working out and stuff. And then yeah, yeah. like she was just amazed at how much she could. She said she couldn't believe. She was like, "I only thought I couldn't do these things, but yeah. I could it, do them." <laughs> she actually said, "I mean, this is evidently a quote from the woman. It doesn't seem possible that wrong thinking could have kept me so weak, but it has." And mm-hmm. you know, we hear that all the time. Other people who go out and start doing the work, and they're going into the things they fear, and they'll come back. It's like, "Oh, did I overdo it?" Like, I feel badly today, so I must have overdid it yesterday. And there's really almost no such thing as overdoing it. Yeah. Like, go do more then. Like, do more. Like, do that again. So, yeah. and then you learn, like, oh, there is no such thing as overdoing it. So, yeah. Although, yeah. do you want to clarify? Because you do talk about the flooding thing. And I oh, think yeah. people read yeah. that that's what overdoing it is. That's true. So flooding, and this does come up a lot, it de- flooding is contextual, right? So it depends on your particular situation. If your safe zone, comfort zone, whatever it is, is you know five minutes from your house and only with your safe person, then flooding would be, I'm fixing this today. And you get in your car and you drive 100 miles away and decide okay. to spend you know overnight by yourself in a hotel. That's a flooding experience. 
But if you are going like into recovery now and you say, hey, today, all right, I'm going to take a walk. Then I'm going to take another walk. Then I'm going to practice driving. Then I'm going to go with, you know, my my wife to the supermarket for a half hour and do the shopping and help cooking. And at okay. the end of the day, you say, hey, I did all these cool things. They're all within your zone. They're achievable. And then maybe the ne- and it's always the next day when somebody says, oh, I, and they're so elated that day. I did all these things. It's awesome. And then the next day they are like back to, oh, but I have anxiety again. Did I overdo it yesterday? No, no, yeah, no. Exactly. it's fine. Do those things again today. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like you worked out and overdid it and now you can't walk the next day. Right. Like, You're sore or something like that. It doesn't it work that way. Yeah. 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 Doing those things is the positive experience we talked about in the beginning. You need to do those things again and again and again. You cannot overdo it. There's no such thing. Yeah. I right, think I coming from my own experience that I was talking about when I was white knuckling through my life, I'm just trying to think if anyone else is doing that sort of thing that I did. I don't think flooding exists in that context because no. I would go anywhere and do anything, but just right. have a hellish time kind of doing anything. If it was going to the pub to meet my friends, if it was sitting on my sofa watching TV, if it was flying across the world, like it, yeah. <laughs> it was just panic attacks everywhere. So. When you're living the way you lived, I think the way you describe it, because I didn't know you back then, but there's no, there is no such thing as flooding because you never build a safe bubble. Yeah. So flooding is when you take your safe bubble, which is really not necessarily physically a thing, but just situational, and you explode right. it instantaneously and like go 10 times bigger than the bubble. You you didn't have that. You were still out doing stuff, traveling the yeah. world and doing gigs and do all this stuff. So uh, yeah, you didn't you never made a safe zone. You weren't helping yourself, but you never made a safe zone either. No. So, yeah. <laughs> I think I was just yeah, I never had a safe zone. So everything was like an unsafe zone. <laughs> just yeah, briefly, like one good question I think people would probably be interested in. So many people who don't know what this is, especially if they started as a child, and you've mentioned that you, you can go all the way back to childhood with this thing. They didn't even know what it was. And they say, like, well, I just thought that this was the way people were. Do you ever have yeah. that? Like this is just normal to be afraid and anxious and like tied up in knots all the time. Do you ever think that? until you figured out that it wasn't normal and you could be different? No, because when it, well, uh, yeah, probably like when I think back to before when I had like, cause basically I had a, a huge panic attack out of the blue one night when I was 11 and sitting watching TV with my parents and I just went, Bleh. Yeah. <laughs> and it seems like, and I know this is impossible, but it seemed like it lasted for nine months, like nonstop continually. Oh, you know, I wasn't at school. I just, you know, and so I yeah. knew that that wasn't normal. Because okay. This, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it was just yeah. like level 1000, you know, like there was no way I'd ever seen anyone acting like that before, you know. Makes so, sense. but when I think back to before that, uh, you know, I was like really afraid of things and I think I overthought things a lot and put a lot attached really weird significance to things and, you know, and um I guess I just thought that was normal and it, you know. Yeah. But what is not I don't know what normal is anyway, so yeah, really. what is what is normal anyway? This is all philosophical now, but the <laughs> next thing she talks about, she calls it she she entitles it the section, and we're all actually almost done at this point. There's not much that much more left, but she calls it the old forgotten sensations, and she's essentially addressing that thing, and and just to bring it into the modern terms that we hear from the people that we deal with every day, I've had such a good two weeks, which means ninety nine percent of the time means is that the, did that was an S setback. Oh, we did, I do that? did I just do that? No, I'm doing it. <laughs> oh, were you doing it? <laughs> I was drawing like a big S. Oh, like we need to get you a telestrator, a setback thing. She does. She talks about setback in this, the return of the symptoms or the old familiar feelings. And that's that thing that's like I've had such a good week and I've had such a good week usually translates to, for most people, I wasn't feeling that anxious. And that is yeah. great. There's nothing wrong with that. Like that's a nice good life to have, right? But um, and then they feel anxious again. It's like, uh oh, it's a huge setback. I'm back to square one. Obviously, I'm broken. She talks about this specific thing. When the sensations that you haven't experienced for a while come back, that could be in two days or a week or a month or five years. Doesn't yeah. matter when. Like she talks about this. And she talks that sometimes people struggle so much with the setback because it feels so much worse because it's contrasted against like the brilliant like peace and sort of like hope that came with that good period and then when it like goes back to how it was you know it feels so much worse because it's in so much contrast to because before you're just going along at this level of just like it's just you know feeling bad or whatever you know and then when you sort of start to have like this good 
good period it's just like oh my god and and like all that sort of hope enters your world that hasn't maybe been there in so long and so that when you go back to how you were before because it's not just an instant cure as we've been talking about yeah so it will go back um then it just feels so much more hopeless and lots of people she says that lots of people say that like they just feel like uh, when they hit that sort of depression of like going back to it again they just feel so hopeless they're like well, maybe i'm just not cut out for this i just don't right. think i could handle the you know yeah the i'm clearly we hear like i'm clearly doing this wrong i don't know what it is I, you know i'm, I'm never going to get better all those things happen but i think one of the key indicators somebody asked me a friend of ours the, the other day said did what did you do when you had those feelings that said well I, this is i'm never going to get better what if it comes no they actually asked me how did you deal with those thoughts of like what if it comes back and I, yeah. I was able to answer that and say, like, I never worried about what if it comes back. Here's the difference. So a good period that precedes the setback, quote unquote setback, if the good period is this is a really good time because I don't feel those things that I hate, then just be ready because they're going to come back and just know they're going to come back and look at it as a chance to practice. The real measure of a good period is, hey, I feel pretty good today, but even if I didn't, I'd be all right. That yeah. is what defines the actual good period. When you get to that part there is no such thing anymore as a setback. You won't even think of it ever again as a setback. So if it returns, it returns. You just keep doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, for she sure. says, I highlighted this. She said, like, well, how do you respond to a setback? And she talks about the person who, like, uh-oh, feels it again and immediately goes back to the old safety stuff. Like, oh, I was feeling so great. I was out. I was doing stuff. Today I'm so anxious. I've stayed in bed all day. Mm -hmm. Like she's literally says, <laughs> never do this, <laughs> nerd buzzer. Never do this. Never let the unexpected return of panic, whenever it may strike, even if it comes years later, never let it shock you into running away from it, ever. Yeah, never run away from it. Right, never run away from it, whether it's a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, or 10 years from now. It doesn't matter. Never run away from it. And I think, just to clarify that, you can never engineer out your humanity. So that initial flash of fear will always happen. To, it happens to me. Probably happens to you. It happens to every human being. Yeah, like, of course. You can't engineer away the first fear, the flash of fear, but you can. It's not what happens in the first two seconds. It's what happens in seconds three to ten that determine everything else. Yeah. Right. So even when it comes back, you have to stop for a second, have that flash of fear. Oh, oh my God. And then like, oh, wait a minute. What am I supposed to do? I know what I'm supposed to do. And then do it. That's the yeah. only response to that. It's the only possible, the only response that you can have is that. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I really like I mean, I don't always get that right. <laughs> but what I do make sure I do is that I don't repeatedly get it wrong. Thank you. Right. Because she said like the last line pretty much of the chapter or one of the last lines is that you may falter, but you will never be completely overwhelmed again. And Correct. like that and, that and that I just feel like, yeah, because so I just wanted to talk quickly about the she talks about the worst setback of all, because I love this. And I, I have yeah. experience of this as well, okay. is that she says often, so you know, like the road to recovery is not completely linear, right? Like, so you go like good, bad, and you, you know, blah, blah, blah. but eventually, like you'll sort of make you sort of climb your way out of it through going through and practicing and learning and learning and doing it again and again where your brain starts to realize you're not in any danger and all of that but she says this sometimes happens and it's usually when people are so close to being fully recovered that they have like just the mother of all setbacks yeah. where it just feels like they go back to square one maybe even further and this personally happened to me as well do you okay. like I was I was doing really well I like recovered in the I think I started recovering in like October came completely off the Valium by like November December I was like really like learning how to be like drug free January I went on holiday to South Africa February found out I was pregnant and just went oh my god <laughs> and I just like you know I planned it but I just lost it I just it just shocked me and I was just in so much I just was like a person just in shock, just going, 
and and I just sat on my sofa for what felt like weeks with, yeah. <laughs> and like I wasn't even agoraphobic before and I somehow went back to square one I went back to taking Valium and I was pregnant at this point it was just terrible oh, I, I remember this against remember all this. the doctors yeah. you know against what the doctor was telling me to do and I was just freaking out you know I was just absolutely just you know I lost it I went beyond I was like at minus th square minus three never mind square one you know yeah and um, and I was just like, well, this is it, you know, and it felt like months and months of just me sitting in my house and able to even like look out the window. <laughs> and, um, and like I said, it wasn't even like I was like, like that before, like I was going out and doing stuff, but just having panic attacks. And I just I froze. I just couldn't yeah, even get yeah. off the sofa. <laughs> but it didn't and then last remember, that long, though. Yeah, no, it yeah. was about two weeks. Yeah, right, right. But, yeah, and I remember texting you and, and you saying, like, you're fine. Just do the work. You know what to do. Yeah. Just keep, do it again. Just go out the house and <laughs> do, it do it again. again. And that yeah. is when I read Claire Weeks. That's when I discovered Claire. Not discovered. I rediscovered right. Claire Weeks. And, you know, all that stuff about floating out the door. And, and I just sort of did it. And then I was, like, better. I was, like, fully better within, like, I think about two weeks, I was like fully better again. Right. And so I had, so having been like, oh, I'm, I think I'm completely recovered to like, pff, oh, pff, 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 and yeah, then yeah, drop yeah. even yeah. further than I was. And then to come out again using exactly the same methods. It wasn't anything else. You know what I mean? It was just right. facing, right. accepting, not avoiding the panic, not avoiding the anxiety, understanding what it was just to then like just sort of flow out of the cave so like easily as well and now it's four years later or three and a half yeah, four, four years later, yeah. Yeah. and i'm yeah. fine do you know what i mean like and i just have so much confidence now like i because we see people that have like done really well with their recovery but you can tell there's this fear of like but what if i go back to how i was what if it what if it comes back you know right right there is, there is, I know you can't hear this because you don't have headphones on. I don't know what alien is in, eavesdropping on our conversation right now, but wait, there's a regular, like it sounds like a cow is mooing. <laughs> Sorry oh, for if you're listening. Is it Vronsky snoring? He's, oh, Vronsky is snoring. I'm like, what is that? It's so loud in my headphones. <laughs> you could see me adjusting my gain and stuff. I'm like, mate, am I picking up a truck or something? Oh, that's so funny. Uh, it's I think it's snoring. a dog snoring. Yeah, it's her snoring. It's so regular. I'm like, what is this? You just discovered everyone. alien life. Oh, I'm a huge Ronsky fan. <laughs> Let her snore. That's fine. Now we know what it is. Who cares? Oh, <laughs> I love it. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry. I got sidetracked by that. But that's I okay. Think, yeah. So, yeah, that, we get that, people that are doing really well with their recovery, and you can see it lurking in the back of their mind. What if it comes oh, back? Yeah. Right. And like now, and so I say, let it come back. I say, let yeah. them have the setback because yeah. once you come out of the mother of all setbacks, and for you, possibly because you'd already recovered when you were at university, right? Yeah. And then yeah. it came back to you right. years later. I mean, right. in some ways, you could call that like just a really bad setback. <laughs> yeah, it was like, a, like an eight month or year setback, sure. Yeah. <laughs> But I but, think so, you're but having right. come like, out of it twice using basically the same right. methods. Do you Absolutely. know what I mean? It sort of yeah. reinforces the method of just like I really oh, yeah. have no problem if it comes if it comes back because it's right. not going to come back now because I'm not going to get overwhelmed by it. I have absolutely no no fear that it will return now. So that last which doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens to many people, you know, or, or some people at least. That mother of all setbacks right near the end before you kind of turn that corner. It sort of has to be many sports teams on the way to winning a championship will lose in the finals first. Ooh. Then they come back. Yes. Like to use a sports analogy for all, everybody, all these sports, remember, many of the greatest teams experienced that last setback. They got all the way to the end and they lost the big game. They lost the final series. Then they oh, came yeah, back a year or two later and they film. won. Yeah. I was watching that film about, I can't remember a baseball team. Any, <laughs> they, many, no, these. And then, yeah. but then they came. He put, like brought in a new management method. Anyway, right, right. Many sports. <laughs> it's a quite famous have, film. Yeah, in in sports all over the world, like that's a common thing, even in team sports. Like you, you almost have to learn how to deal with the adversity yeah. that one last time. You get all the way to the top, oh, but then you lose the big game. That's the last setback. Then you come yeah. back and win. So. Yeah, well, it's a in thing. Boxing, I think like often the best boxers are ones that have then had like a massive defeat, right? And it's right. the comeback that's so that's much. The comeback. That's exactly yeah. right. 
But, you know, just to, yeah. you know, we're a little longer than we usually are, but I think it's okay because it's good stuff. Um, we hear the setback thing all the time. And I, somebody has said that, and I started using it too, and I don't remember who coined it, and I'm sorry, but, like, you can't unknow what you now know. You don't, yeah. you don't forget, like, you don't unlearn all of this stuff. So there really is no going backwards. There's no external process that just comes in and wipes you out. It's not a wave coming in that you can, a tidal wave. Essentially, it's just life. And she talks about that. Sometimes there's strain tension. Like she actually says yeah. some strain, some tension. Um, so whatever it is. That I think if you're under a lot of stress, it can definitely, you know, Absolutely. get your nerves all jangling and already yes. sort of sensitized. She even mentions this. She even mentions it. But in the end, even when that happens, and you're right, especially people who are new in this process of recovery, like I had somebody this morning that actually mentioned, I think, you know, a, an over full plate. And my plate is so full right now. And she feels like she's going backwards. It's a health anxiety thing. But I'm like, well, no, you're still, you're new to this. You're two months into it. That's not a yeah. long time to learn these new competencies and confidence. So anything that's stress in your life, anything that's, you know, a bad event in your life, whatever, may trigger these things. But in the end, you didn't unlearn. You didn't suddenly lose it. No, no tidal wave came in and wiped everything away from you. You just had a yeah. different change of circumstances. You felt some different things. And you started acting the old ways again, which is in the end a choice. And I, I know that people hate sometimes when I say that, but it is a choice. So you just yeah. you just you fell into a little bit of a bad habit for a week or two. And then you changed it. Yeah. When I, you know, when I found out I was pregnant and stuff like, you know, that sort of decline into just sitting on my sofa, like, like I just, I could have got up and got, got out, but I chose to just, yeah. I did just you chose to sit there. It was my right. undoing. And right. I did not, and I did know all this stuff and I knew it and I'd done it and I did somehow forget, but just as soon as I actually, I didn't forget it. I just stopped doing it. I just stopped practicing right. it. Do you know what That's I mean? The difference. And then as soon as I did it again, I just went, whoop. <laughs> yeah, because you still knew all the stuff. You had those experiences. Just, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So that's, I think it's super important to think about in setback. Like, it's not an external thing that happened that wiped out all your progress. Like, no, some things changed. You felt some stuff you didn't feel like, and you just went into some old habits, whether they be mental, cognitive, emotional, or behavioral. Like, all yeah. right, no problem. The good news always is that even in a setback, you are still in control of the process. It's still not an external thing that is, yeah. like, going to outside of your control so that's always a good thing i honestly encourage the mother of all setbacks i encourage it i'd say i like you can see the confidence in the people that have gone through that like yes. that the, like then it's just like no now i'm bulletproof yeah there's one person in particular she's in ireland right now i think you know you probably know who i'm talking about she went through it yeah okay. um not too long ago and you could see it happen but she is just on fire now like just in the group yeah. that invite, she is now like a different person. I, I mean, she'll, she'll know who she is when she's listening right now. But um, so what else are we up to here? I think we're almost done here. Um, she talks about memory, um, how memory could kind of stir things up. And then she goes, one of the things that I thought was interesting was how she talks about um, in going in search of the old sensations, which I'm not okay. sure. Yeah. So I, I went backwards just a little bit. But I want to bring that up. She, so she literally, she writes, you may sometimes go in search of the old sensations to try yourself out, thinking it too good to be true. I, I don't know if people necessarily are searching it to try themselves. Some people do that. Like, let me see if I, I can make that. it happen again. Yeah. And that's yeah. great. That's actually not a bad exercise to do. Do it. Go ahead. Try and feel bad. Like, if you can. Because I think that displays, that's a, that's a sense of confidence and almost like, all right, I'm willing to try to see if I can make this crappy stuff happen. So it's not a bad thing. You're learning, you're, you're honing your skills. You're learning some confidence there. I think a lot of people wind up looking for the old sensations because of that thing where they're just, they're not there yet. So they're still worried that it might come back. Like it's some monster that's stalking them. It, what if it shows up today? And they're worried because they've spent so many years like trying to hide from it. And now it's like, well, what if it, if you're still worried that it can get you, then yes, you will find yourself looking for those things. Okay. You're not trying to get them, but you're always looking for them. People talk about it all the time. Like, I don't know. I've had a couple of really good days. Why am I looking? Why am I scanning and looking to see how yeah. I feel? Well, because you're nervous that it's going to come back and get you. That's why. So yeah. I think that looking for the old sensation sometimes is something you choose to actively do to test your recovery, which is great. Sometimes it's just an indicator that like, oh, I guess I'm still afraid of this. That's all right, though. It just means you're still learning. Nothing wrong with that. It's all good. Yeah. So it's a process. It was, yeah, I, th I thought it was worth it bring it up but i think yeah, we pretty sure. much covered the whole shebang no 
Yeah, I think just it's important to mention that she says that, like, you know, so even once you've recovered and in all this, that, you know, like the flash of panic, and it's that the flash of panic can be so intense and so, and it really can hit you even years later. Yeah. And that that is, if you can have that happen to you and, and like not sort of fall into your old habits and not sort of be afraid of it, then, yeah. or, you know, like even though you might be sort of afraid and just like, oh my God, you know, like if you can sort of then be like, oh, okay, this is a panic attack. <laughs> right. and, and sort of like, you know, just let it sort of like happen. Then then you really are recovered. So like it's, it's just it's worth mentioning again that recovery is not the complete absence of any anxiety, that it's yeah. not the absence of any panic, that it can still hit you at some points, you know. And I don't know, like... I don't. I think some people are more prone to it than others for just a whole myriad of different reasons, and some yeah. people are just kind of anxious people. And do you know what I mean? And like, mm -hmm. oh, they're sort of like wired to go that way when when sort of lots of stresses sort of hit them, or they get overtired or whatever. I don't know. Right. You know, it happens right. to me. When I'm really tired or stuff like this. But if you can deal with that panic and not be afraid of it and, and not change your life or not even sort of think about it. I mean, if yeah. we didn't like sort of help people in an anxiety, I honestly don't even know when I would even think about anxiety these days. No, you know I saying? would almost never think of it. From, I, that's true. That's absolutely dead on true. Like, like, even so when I'm, I ever need to have to talk yeah, about it. Even if I'm feeling anxious, I just pay it. So, it's just like sort of like a... Oh, Great. Yeah. Now I'm feeling yeah. anxious and I've got to go to work. Like that's a drag, isn't it? Like it's yeah. just it's just a sort of annoyance. It's like it doesn't even register anything more than just like a Right. It's like waking up with the flu or being cold, you know, have a cold. Like oh, this really isn't ideal, is it? But never yeah. mind. And it's interesting because the, the times when it will happen for me, it's I actually this is gonna sound crazy, but sometimes if I really am honest about it. The presence of anxiety for me is almost a positive mechanism. It's the thing that tells me that even I have a limit of like <laughs> sleep deprivation and projects and like all that stuff. And it's like, if I'm yeah. having that, that usually tells me like, oh, I guess I probably should sleep a little bit more. And like, that's when it's going to hit me. But it's like, yeah. all right, no, there's that alarm. I guess I got to do something now. Or you to get some sleep or like here's a friendly reminder that you're right, only doing right right you're not you're not a machine like even though so you might act like one anxiety. right they said you know so it's, and you can you can if you're listening to us you could probably get to that place too where it's not like oh no here it comes like well whatever no it's just if, like, any, a... like it'll make me angry the few times that I've, I've even felt compelled to tell someone how i felt it's always because i'm just pissed off at myself like just yeah. i need to tell you another human being that kind of messed up here and i'm not sleeping and i'm just yeah, now I feel like crap. So all right, I I've said had it. it when I've been really <laughs> ill. Like I had kidney stones. I was actually eight months pregnant at the time. I had kidney stones, and like, so I was having all these really strange symptoms, and then like my body just started having a panic attack, and I'm just like, great, now I can't really? even tell what's the symptom <laughs> and what's things. So I was just like, I don't even know if I'm feverish because. I feel really hot, but that's how I feel when I'm anxious. <laughs> so like, yeah. It was just like really annoying. It was just like, just get lost panic attack. You've been really unhelpful at the minute. I, I need to know what's <laughs> actually wrong with me. I'm pregnant. I got kidney, kidney stones. Really? Now? Really? Yeah. yeah like, I get it. Just, yeah. And because I didn't know it was kidney stones at that point. So obviously I was just like, oh my God, there's something really wrong with me. And so okay. just then for the panic attack to jump, like piggyback on that, I was just like, <laughs> don't need you right now this is <laughs> no. really inconvenient <laughs> yeah yeah i get it i get it all right i think we've, we've done chapter nine that's good so we went a little longer than we usually do if you're hung in this whole time thank you um i'm i'm keep getting reminded i'm obligated to say if you're listening on itunes and not on youtube but you know if you're watching it on youtube then hit the thumbs up or something or subscribe to the channel if you're listening on itunes like give us like a five star rating or something or write a review and thanks for coming by and join the give thing. like thumbs down on youtube i don't understand that just a, here's my 10 second YouTube brand. YouTube is a steaming pile of horse crap. It really is. <laughs> I mean, it's the second biggest search engine on the internet. There's a lot of great stuff. Like you can learn all kinds of things on YouTube, but YouTube is the biggest collection of angry people that I've ever met in my life. Like in no other place in, in humanity that I know people gather just to say shitty things to each other. So yeah, I give a thumbs down to shitty comments. So there you go. If you don't like it, I guess thumbs down if you want, if it makes you feel better. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming by, guys. And um, we'll do chapter 10 maybe in a 
next week or two if we can. Yeah, we'll do yeah. Our best. Sure. We, we will cool. finish this book one day. All right, I'll see you later. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs> stop recording.